guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Now, before I even get started on these questions, which are going to be mixed, by the way, I want to go over these. These are my wrist immobilizers. So um, I have carpal tunnel syndrome, and I've been in denial for a couple months because for a couple months I've been feeling pain, and I've just been massaging, you know, my thumb area until it got so bad in the middle of the night, like the pain would wake me up. So... I did what I should have done months ago and I went ahead, I went on Amazon, I ordered wrist um, immobilizers. And so what it does guys, it keeps me from flexing my wrist. So what happens, people with carpal tunnel syndrome, and this usually happens to like typists or secretaries or people who use computers a lot because they have to what? Bend, flex their wrist in order to type. So what happens is this median nerve that runs here, that constant flexion, right? That's what causes the pain to run along usually uh, the thumb, the index, and the middle finger. For me, it's just the both thumbs that is just very painful, but people who have carpal tunnel syndrome, that pain can actually radiate to the other fingers. And so when you get um, the wrist splints or immobilizer, it really keeps you from that flexion, from that movement, and even that thumb flexion. And guys, it has made such a difference, I kid you not. Within just the first couple hours of having that wrist immobilizer, I felt the pain decrease because you don't realize how often you're performing this movement with your wrist. If you're someone like me that's always using the computer, always typing, you're doing it and you don't even realize it. So within a couple hours, I really felt the difference. So I want you to remember that, guys, when it comes to a uh, carpal tunnel syndrome one of the things you are going to suggest to your patient because remember this is not a medication so you absolutely can and should suggest it and you'll see it in your textbook is the wrist immobilizer or wrist splints it makes a world of difference all right with getting that out the way guys okay so on this video, I'm going to be covering a variety of questions. They're all mixed. So this is a great video for anyone that's studying for NCLEX or they're studying for end of semester a cumulative exam. This would be great for you. So before I get started, guys, um, let's go ahead. Anyone who's interested, look, I always start my videos now with prayer. Please close your eyes, bow your head. You're not into that. No problem. Just go ahead and fast forward. All right. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us, Jesus. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies, God. Thank you, Father God, for allowing us this moment to go over this information, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and the favor that you had over our lives, over our children's lives, our spouses, our loved ones, the people who are supporting us, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we ask you for forgiveness for our sins because we know we fall short of your glory every single moment, Lord. But we tell you, thank you, Father God, that we have this opportunity to come before you and even ask for forgiveness and know that's already been given. Lord, I pray over every viewer right now that's watching this video, Father God, whatever they're struggling with, whatever areas that they've had difficulty comprehending, Lord, I ask that you please give them wisdom, Father God. Help them to understand this information, Father God. Help them so that when they see the same content on the next exam, they are able to figure out what's being asked of them and answer the question correctly. Father God, I pray for every single viewer. They're here for a reason, Lord. I ask that you help them, Father God. Help them get through this nursing program. Help them get that license, Lord. And let them not be selfish when they get that license and they use it just for themselves, but let them use that license as a way to be a blessing to others. Lord, thank you for what you're about to do for us in this video. Thank you for the understanding that you've already provided. We praise your name and we give you all the glory. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. During a health history, a 59-year-old male client with non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus says he is not feeling right. Which of the following client statements is most probably unrelated to diabetes mellitus? One, I have this cut on my hand that doesn't want to heal. Two, no matter how much I drink, I'm still thirsty all the time. Three, I seem to be unable to get an erection. I've never been impotent before. Or four, in the past couple of weeks, I've been having a lot of trouble urinating. Fix my camera. And guys, the correct answer is four. In the past couple of weeks, I've been having a lot of trouble urinating. So go back to the question, guys. They're asking us in the question, which one's probably unrelated to diabetes. So we're looking for the answer choice that probably has nothing to do with diabetes. And number four is the correct answer. You're having trouble urinating. Um, look at that question. 59 year old and it's a male. 
What do you think this is most likely related to? Prostate. Remember that prostate encircles that bladder neck and maybe that patient's having some type of enlargement of the prostate and that's what's causing them to have trouble uh, urinating. And you know, it could be a variety of other issues either, just prostate's the first thing to come to my mind. But the point is, that is what's most likely has nothing to do with diabetes. Now let's look at the other answer choices that do have something to do with diabetes. One, I have this cut on my hand that doesn't want to heal. That's poor wound healing. Doesn't that have to do with diabetes? Absolutely. Patients with di diabetes have poor wound healing. That's why so many end up having amputations of different extremities. They end up having infections that can possibly turn into sepsis, right? So that couldn't be our answer choice. Two, no matter how much I drink, I'm still thirsty all the time. Well, we know when it comes to diabetes, uh, signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia is what? Polyuria, the excessive urination. Polyphagia, that excessive hunger. And polydipsia, that excessive thirst. So of course that has something to do with diabetes. So that's why we didn't choose that answer choice. And now we have three. I seem to be unable to get an erection. I've never been impotent before. Well, guys, you know that diabetes, one of the adverse effects of diabetes, it can cause impotence in males. Absolutely. So that's why number four is the correct answer choice. By the way, guys, I didn't mention this before, but I'll mention it now. You know, I got to get my plug in. If you're new to this channel, welcome. If you haven't done so already, guys, please like and subscribe to my channel, guys. Like this video, please subscribe to it and press that red notification bell so that every time a new video is released, you'll be notified immediately. If you haven't done so already, guys, um, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Matter of fact, on TikTok, I've been getting crazy amount of messages saying, Professor D, where are you? You haven't posted anything. And usually I post about three to six videos a day. And I really haven't posted in about a week due to the pain I've had with my thumbs. So I'm going to be back there. But I've got tons of videos for you on my other social media platforms. That is not the same as what you see here on uh, YouTube. So if you want that extra studying get that in go ahead check me on my other social media platforms and also don't forget guys my website i have audio lessons available on my website nexusnursinginstitute.com okay let's continue the questions a four-year-old's brought to the clinic for a checkup it's determined that the family does not have floor i can't pronounce guys fluoridated water. The nurse would advise which of the following when using fluoride supplements. One, give with meals. Two, do not eat or drink for 30 minutes after the supplement. Three, make sure to take the supplement with milk. Or four, have the child swallow the tablet immediately after putting it in their mouth. And guys, the correct answer is two, do not eat or drink for 30 minutes after the supplement. Why? It has to be given on an empty stomach. This has to be given on an empty stomach. So they are not going to eat or drink for 30 minutes after the supplement. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, gift with meals. We know that's wrong because I just told you, empty stomach. Three, be sure to take it with milk. We know that's wrong because I just told you, empty stomach. And then choice four, have them swallow a tablet immediately after putting it in their mouth. Absolutely not. Matter of fact, first of all, if it's a child, children usually can't swallow tablets so they get the liquid form and they have to swish it. But let's say they are able to um, have a tablet. What they would do is chew that tablet, swish it in the mouth, okay? So they're not swallowing it uh, right away. So that's still the wrong answer. Number two is the correct choice. Next question. A 14-year-old girl with type 1 diabetes is monitoring her blood glucose level at home. Which of the following indicates that she understands appropriate care management strategies for a blood glucose level of 250? One, take insulin, drink water. Two, skip the next dose of insulin, drink fruit juice. Three, eat a high carb meal and exercise. Or four, inject glucagon and rest. And guys, the correct answer is one, take insulin and drink water. Come on, guys. Blood sugar is supposed to be what? 70 to 110. This patient's blood sugar is 250. So they need to take their insulin and drink water. You see choices two, three, and four. Those are, you know, suicide attempts. Patient's blood sugar is 250. Remember, I told you it's supposed to be 70 to 110. It's 250. Why would you skip the next dose of insulin? And on top of that, where was I? 
On top of that, drink fruit juice to make your insulin go even higher. Are you trying to go into a diabetic coma? Look at choice three. Drink a high carb meal. What does carb break? What do carbs break down into? Sugar, right? It says eat a high carb meal and exercise. Absolutely not. Choice four, and by the way, guys, when the blood sugar is that high, the patient should be exercising as well. And then choice four, inject glucagon and rest. What does glucagon do? Glucagon increases blood sugar. Glucagon is what? For when the blood sugar is low, not for when it's high. So that's why number one is the correct answer choice. A newly diagnosed, a child newly diagnosed with rheumatic fever if they receive penicillin therapy. Which of the following statements by the parents would lead the nurse to judge that the parents understand the teaching about penicillin as part of the treatment plan for rheumatic fever? One, how long will it take for the penicillin to help relieve the joint discomfort? Two, our child should take the medication until the physician discontinues it. Three, we need to also give these pills to our other children to prevent them from getting rheumatic fever. And four, we should give our child the medication on a full stomach. And guys, the correct answer is two, our child should take the medication until the physician uh, discontinues it. So the reason that this child is getting penicillin for rheumatic fever is uh, that penicillin, which is an antibiotic, is supposed to kill that strep that's causing um, the inflammation and this reaction that's happening in the patient's body. That's why they're getting the antibiotic, okay? Because remember, guys, with rheumatic... Um, fever this is an autoimmune disease where basically the patient's own body their own immune system is causing the issue so that's why they're getting the antibiotics to kill that strep that's causing the chain reaction all right so now let's look at the other choices one how long will it take for penicillin to relieve joint discomfort the penicillin is not going to relieve the joint discomfort. Again, the penicillin is an antibiotic. And the reason they're getting it is to kill that bacteria, to kill that staph that is causing the inflammation and um, 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 the, the pain and everything else that comes with rheumatic fever. But that antibiotic itself doesn't decrease the pain. So that's wrong. Three, we need to also give these pills to our other children to prevent them from getting rheumatic fever. That's not true. Giving them um, antibiotics is not going to uh, prevent the other children from getting um, rheumatic fever. And by the way, it's not an infectious disease, so it's not something that they can catch just because their sibling has it. Choice four, we should give our child the medication on a full stomach you know better. This is an antibiotic. How's it given on an empty stomach, not a full stomach? So guys, number two is the correct answer choice. The nurse is assessing a multigravitated 36 week gestation plans to assess the client for symptoms of pregnancy induced hypertension. The nurse should plan to first assess the client's one face, two reflexes, three pulse or four ankles. All right, guys, so when we're assessing for pregnancy-induced hypertension signs and symptoms, we're going to be looking at the face. Now, those signs and symptoms of classic, guys, of pregnancy-induced hypertension, where do we see that edema? Where do we see that swelling? In the face and the fingers, right? Those extremities on the upper portion of the body. Now, on the lower portion of the body, such as the feet, that's normal in pregnancy. But if we see swelling in the face or the fingers, uh-oh, that's not a good thing. So number one's the correct answer. We see that sudden swelling, that sudden weight gain. Now look at choices two, three, and four. Uh, reflexes, pulses, ankle. First of all, let's go to the um, reflexes. That doesn't tell us anything um, about uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension. Nothing at all. Um, the pulse. Same thing, ankle. Now let's talk about the ankles, guys. Ankles, if we see swelling of the ankles in pregnancy, that is normal. And the reason we see that swelling is because of that huge influx of fluid and that fluid shift that happens in pregnancy. The lower extremities, that is normal. But if we see it again in the fingers, in the face, in a sudden weight gain, that's going to be um, suspicious and we're gonna go ahead and assess that patient further. A parent group is discussing different types of punishment. The parent asked the nurse to dis 
discuss corporate punishment. The nurse tells the group that corporal punishment, one, does not physically harm the child, two, reinforces the idea that violence is not acceptable, three, can result in children becoming accustomed to spanking and requiring more severe punishment for the same, with the same results, for the same results, or four, can be beneficial in teaching children what they should do. And guys, the correct answer is three. It can result in children becoming accustomed to spanking and requiring more severe punishment for the same results. That is absolutely true, guys. Um, study after study after study have shown that uh, um, corporal punishment such as spanking is not the most effective measure for disciplining a child. Okay, now let's look at the other choices. One, does not physically harm the child. Of course it does. You're spanking the child. You're hitting them. How does that not physically harm them? So that's false. Two, it reinforces the idea that violence is not acceptable. How would that reinforce the idea that violence is not acceptable when you're committing violence against a child? You're actually physically hitting them. So that's false. And then choice four can be beneficial in teaching children about what they should do. Actually, spanking a child, if it teaches them anything, it teaches them what they should not do, not what they should do. So the more reasonable thing to do with that child when you're disciplining them, depending on the age group, okay? If it's a small child, such as a toddler, what are you going to do? You're going to put them in timeout for as many minutes as their age. So if they're three years old, they go to timeout for three minutes. An older child, you may take away, you know, something that they like, or maybe an outing was planned, but that is more effective than the physical harm to the child. So guys, number three is the correct answer. If a nursing goal is to increase a child's protein intake, the nurse would encourage a child to eat which of the following foods that the child likes. One, a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Two, fruit-flavored yogurt. Three, nacho chips and salsa. Or four, crackers with butter and jelly. And guys, the correct answer is two, fruit flavored yogurt. Remember guys, yogurt is made from what? Milk, and that's high in protein, so that's why two is the correct answer. Have you guys noticed there's something that number one, three, and four have in common? They're high in carbs. We want something that's high in protein. So we have number one, a bacon, by the way, guys, bacon's high in fat. A bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Sandwich, the bread used for the sandwich is carbs. Number three and uh, number three, nacho chips and salsa. So nacho chips are high in carbs. Number four, crackers with butter and jelly. Crackers is high in carbs. Butter is high in fat. But we're looking for protein, so number two would be our correct answer because again, that yogurt is mil made with milk, which is high in protein. Number two is the correct answer. Two days after a client's wife and child were found dead in a flood, the client returns to the crisis center and and says he thinks it would be better to end it all right now and join my wife and kid wherever they are. The nurse has already determined that the client has no history of psychiatric problems. In terms of the seriousness of the client's suicide threat, his risk should be considered as one, very low, as long as the client speaks of suicide, he's unlikely to carry out the act. Two, low, a person who has not had psychiatric problems in the past rarely carries out a first suicide threat. Three, moderate. The client appears to be making an effort to gain attention and extra support. Four, high. The client's suicide threat can be considered a call for help and should be taken seriously. And guys, the correct answer is number four. Any threat or any discussion of wanting to uh, commit suicide should always be taken seriously. It doesn't matter if this patient has a psychiatric history or not. Now, if you go back to the question, you see that something traumatic just happened to them. They lost their family and now they're verbalizing that, you know, they're having thoughts that it would be better to be dead. That needs to be taken seriously. Okay. And whenever you even suspect a patient's having suicidal thoughts, much less them letting you know they're having it, what is the first thing you do? You ask them directly, are you having thoughts of harming yourself? And if they say yes, the very next question is to find out if they have a plan. How? 
How do you plan on harming yourself? And the third thing to find out is, do they have access to the vehicle that they were going to use to kill themselves? So for example, if they plan to shoot themselves, do they actually have access to a gun? So four is absolutely the correct answer, guys. Which of the following would the nurse evaluate as an expected outcome for a client who's undergone surgical repair of an inguinal hernia? One, client will verbalize understanding of instructions instructions to avoid lifting for two to six weeks after surgery Two, the client's voiding patterns will return to normal within six months after surgery three the client will use a cane for assistance with ambulation for two to six weeks after surgery or four the client will remain on a soft diet until the wound is healed And guys, the correct answer is one, the client with verbalized understanding of instructions to avoid lifting for two to six weeks after surgery. So let's talk about this. Patient just had surgery for inguinal hernia. What is inguinal hernia? Well, first of all, guys, a hernia is any weakness of the muscle in that body, right? Or the tissue. So inguinal hernia, that patient's having a weakness in the abdominal muscle where their gut, their actual intestine, is spilling out is peeping through that um that weakness so the patient had a, a surgery to repair that weakness that hernia so the patient shouldn't be doing any heavy weak uh lifting because we don't want that area where they just had the surgery to open up and for their intestines to spill out again so absolutely no heavy lifting for two and i know it says two to six weeks but really it's more like four to six weeks at least no heavy lifting at all now let's look at the wrong answer choices two the client's voiding pattern will return to normal within six months after surgery they shouldn't have any trouble with voiding pattern the trouble that they had was part of the intestine was spilling through that weakness right that had nothing to do with their bladder so two's number two's wrong three the client will uh, use the cane for assistance with ambulation for two to six weeks after surgery why would they need a cane the only reason they would need a cane is if they needed a cane before they even had the surgery but them needing assistance with ambulation that has nothing to do with the green with the inguinal hernia or the repair choice number four the client will remain on a soft diet until the wound is healed the the patient doesn't need to be on a soft diet. They can go back to a regular diet after surgery. Now, what I'm sure the doctor and the staff will encourage is foods high in fiber because we don't want that patient to develop, you know, constipation, right? We don't want them straining, mm, trying to bear down to get uh, all the fecal matter and the stool, you know, out of the rectum. We don't want them straining. So we'll encourage foods high in fiber, but they can go back to a regular diet. They don't need to be on a soft diet. So guys, that's why number one is the correct answer. A 10 month old child with bronchitis is taken out of the 30% oxygen tent for breakfast because he refuses to eat unless in a high chair. During the feeding, the nurse notes that the child's respiratory rate has increased, he's becoming more irritable, and he's using accessory muscles to breathe. The first action of the nurse should be to, one, assess the pulse rate and respirations and notify the physician. Two, discontinue feeding and place the child back in the tent. Three, perform postural drainage and then complete the feeding. Or four, suction the child's nose with a bulb syringe. And guys, the correct answer is to discontinue the feeding and place the child back in the tent. Guys, this patient is displaying respiratory distress. Look at this. The respiratory rate has increased. They're more irritable and they're using their accessory muscles. They're using their accessory muscles just to breathe. That patient's going through respiratory distress. So we're going to bring them back into the oxygen. They need to be able to breathe. So choice number two, we're gonna stop the feeding. Guys, do you know the work of feeding? That's work. You're trying, you're feeding, you're eating, right? So that work of feeding is going to decrease that patient's uh, perfusion because they're not breathing as they would if they weren't shoving food into their mouth. So the work of breathing itself is putting uh, stress on the patient's body. So we're gonna discontinue the feeding and give them that oxygen, put them back into, into the tent. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, oh my gosh, I don't know how many times that word assess has fooled you students. Assess the pulse rate and respirations and notify the physician. So I want you to picture this. 
this child's having trouble breathing. You see the respirations going up. You see them using their accessory muscles just to breathe. They're like this. <laughs> you see this. And your brain tells you to assess their pulse rate and respirations. Let me ask you something. Assessing their pulse rate and respirations, what is that going to tell you that we don't already know? Because we already know that this patient's in respiratory distress because they told us in the question. So what is assessing their pulse and respiration going to tell us? And then we're going to call the doctor and say, oh, you know, the pulse is this, the respiration is this. I see the patient using uh, accessory muscles. I see the breathing has increased. And the doctor is going to say, all right, well, after you put them in the tent, what did their O2 side go up to? And you're going to say, oh, I don't have them in the tent. Really? Come on, guys. This is how they trick you. You guys cannot fall for this trap. You have to use critical thinking. Don't choose the answer assess just because it says assess. It has to make sense. Now, yes, later you can assess the pulse and respiration. That's wonderful. But the first thing you need to do is put that patient back into the oxygen and see if that O2 sat goes up. And if it doesn't go up, then you're going to call the doctor with the, you know, vital signs. But the first thing you have to do is put that patient back into the oxygen. So, guys, that's why number two is the correct answer. Three, perform postural uh, drainage. Um, you can do all of that later. Right now, what do they need? Oxygen. And four, suction the child's nose with a syringe. There's nothing in the question that even mentions, you know, uh, block uh, nasal passage, right? The first thing you're going to do is give that child oxygen. It's obvious that they can't breathe. After a period of depression and preoccupation with his son's impending death, a father started to adjust to the idea of life without his son. This phenomenon of emotionally reacting to a person's death before it actually occurs is known as one, dysthymia, two, acute grief reaction, three, pathologic mourning, or four, anticipatory mourning. And guys, the correct answer is anticipatory mourning. This is when the person starts to adjust to life without that loved one while that loved one is still alive. And guys, this is a defense mechanism to help protect that per, uh, person um, emotionally and psychologically. Number four is the correct answer. One, two, and three is absolutely false. Next question. A mother brings in her two-year-old adopted Korean child to the clinic for an initial checkup. The child's been living with the adopted family for several weeks. The nurse notes an irregular area of deep excuse me, of deep blue pigment on the child's buttocks extending into the sacral area. The nurse should one, ask the mother in private how the bruise occurred. Two, do nothing concerning this finding. Three, notify social services of a case of possible abuse, child abuse, or four, question the mother about the family's discipline style. And guys, the correct answer is two. Do nothing concerning this finding. And I know as a nursing student, you don't ever want to choose an answer that says to do nothing, right? It's very rare that you're going to get a test question where you do nothing. But this is one of them. <coughs> Excuse me. Why? Because there's no, absolutely nothing wrong with this patient. What does this patient have? A Mongolian spot. How do we know this? Let's go back to the clues. If you go back to the question, it tells you that the patient is Korean. That's of Asian descent. And it also says that the patient has a blue pigment, not bruise, because guys, remember, a bruise comes from uh, a bleeding, right? Microscopic bleeding, hemorrhaging, but it didn't say bruise, it said uh, pigment. And we know that when it comes to Mongolian spites, spites, Mongolian spots, um, Babies of Asian or African descent tend to have Mongolian spots, and this is very normal. So um, that's why we do nothing about it. So let's look at the wrong answer choices. We have one, ask the mother in private how the bruise occurred. That's false. Again, guys, it said pigment, not bruise. And remember, bruise, um, that results from bleeding. That's not what we're what's happening here. And... By the way, guys, even if you suspected abuse, right? Would you ask the mom in private how the bruise happened? Would you even let mom know that you suspected abuse? Absolutely not. You're not going to tip her off. Wrong. Um, 
Choice three, notify social services of a case of public child of uh, child abuse. That's wrong. Even if you suspect child abuse, guys, when it comes to testing, you are not the one who are going to call social services. You suspect abuse. Who are you going to go to? Your supervisor. You always have to go up the chain of command, and the supervisor will contact contact uh, will contact uh, the appropriate authorities. Choice four, question the mother about the family's discipline style. Again, even if you suspect abuse, you are not going to tip off the parents or the, the suspected abuser. So that's false. The correct answer is two. You're going to do nothing. Why? This is a Mongolian spot. And it's going to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's going to disappear on its own. It's going to just lighten up and go away on its own. We're not going to do anything about it. According to Erickson's theory of development, a 13-year-old client dying of cancer normally would be expected to be resolving which of the following psychosocial issues? One, lifetime vocation. Two, social conscience. Three, personal identity. Or four, sense of industry. And guys, the correct answer is three, personal identity. How old is this uh, child? 13. Remember, the adolescent, the work of the adolescent is personal identity. Who am I? And how do they find out who they are? Through their social network, through their social um, um, group. And that's why when it comes to the adolescent, socialization is very, very important because they find out and explore and determine their self-identity by their peer groups. And that's why when you get a test question about a parent that comes in, they're so upset and they're complaining because their teenager doesn't want to spend any time with the family. They used to love spending time with the family at dinner. Now all they care about is their friends. You tell the parents that that's normal. Why? Because they're figuring out their self-identity through their peers. Okay. And so number three is a correct answer. Which of the following nursing diagnoses would receive the greatest priority in the care of an unconscious client with a head injury? One, ineffective airway clearance related to inability to remove respiratory secretions. Two, impaired gas exchange related to shallow, irregular breathing. Three, high risk for injury related to disorientation and decreased level of consciousness. Or four, sensory perceptual, perceptual alterations related to decreased level of consciousness. And guys, the correct answer is one, ineffective airway clearance related to inability to remove respiratory secretions. What does this tell us? And the reason this is a priority, guys, let's go look back at number one, ineffective airway clearance. Why? They can't move the secretions. The secretions are blocking air from getting in and out. This patient's not getting perfusion. Who cares about anything else if that patient can't breathe? Now, I know some of you guys were tempted to choose number two. Let me tell you why number one's the answer, not number two. Let's look at number two. Number two says impaired gas exchange related to shallow, irregular breathing. In order for that patient to have impaired gas exchange, right, the oxygen would have to get from their nose or the mouth all the way to where? The alveoli. Remember, it's in the alveoli that gas exchange happens. Well, number one, air's not moving. So air can't even get to the alveoli for the patient to have a problem with gas exchange. And that's why number one's the correct answer. If number one was not there, number two would have been our priority. But with number one, air can't even get to the alveoli. We can't be worried about gas exchange when air can't even get there, right? That's why number one's our correct answer. So when it comes to priority, number one is going to be our first priority. And then after one, number two is our second priority, the gas exchange, because now at least gas got down to the alveoli. Now we can worry about gas exchange. Then what's our third priority? Risk for injury. After we make sure that our patient can breathe, after we make sure the patient's having adequate gas exchange, we know that perfusion's happening, we want to keep them safe from harm, right? So number three is going to be our third priority, and last is going to be their sensory um, perceptual alterations, because the patient can breathe, the patient's being perfused, gas exchange happening, they're safe, now we can worry about their sensory perception, maybe something's closer than they think it is, we can worry about that later. So um, the order in priority is number one, two, three, and then four.
A child admitted to the hospital with a serum sodium level of 160, receiving 5% dextrose with 0.45 normal uh, saline solution. Half normal saline. Um, the mother asked the child's nurse why the child's receiving sodium. The nurse's best reply would be, your child's sodium is one, high, I'll stop the infusion check with the physician, two, high, but the serum sodium levels decrease too rapidly, it can cause seizures, three, low, we need to give some more sodium IV, or four, normal, the solution will maintain the level. And guys, the correct answer is two, high, but if serum sodium levels decrease too rapidly, it can cause seizures. And that's absolutely true. So guys, your normal sodium level is 135 to 145. Look at the question. This patient's sodium level is what? Where was it? Oh, 160. So it's definitely high. But the problem is, if it drops too quickly, that can cause the patient to go into seizures. Just like glucose, if a patient's, you know, having ketoacidosis, their blood sugar is way too high, five, six, seven hundred, whatever, right? And we drop their blood sugar, right? If we drop it too quickly, that can cause the patient to go into seizures. And that's why you'll see when the patient's blood sugar is high through the roof, they're getting normal saline, they're getting insulin, but they're also getting glucose. And you're like, why is there, why um, are we giving, um, them glucose in the IV when their blood sugar is high, we're trying to bring it down because we don't want to drop it too quickly because that can cause the patient to go into seizures. And that is the same thing for sodium. And that's why guys, number two is the correct answer. A priority nursing goal for the client presenting with pelvic inflammatory disease is one, alteration nutrition, two, self-care deficit, three, alteration comfort, or four, alteration skin integrity. And guys, the correct answer is three, alteration in comfort. Think about it, guys. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, this is when the patient has um, an infection of the reproductive organs and is causing inflammation. This is very painful. And so absolutely out of the choices that's been given to us, guys, is three, alteration comfort. Of course, if, you know, this answer choice, they mentioned the infection, the infection is going to be the priority over the pain, right? But because that's not there, number three is the correct answer. Let's look at the wrong um, answer choices. One, alteration nutrition. No, PID doesn't alter the patient's nutrition. Two, self-care deficit. You know, does it cause a patient to not be able to brush their teeth or drive? So that's false. Four, alteration skin integrity. It doesn't do anything to their skin. But three, alteration comfort, absolutely. Because again, guys, this is severely painful for the woman. So that's why number three is the correct answer. And guys, we are down to our last question. A client's admitted to the inpatient psych unit. He's unshaven, has body odor, and has spots on his shirt and pants. He moves slowly, gazes at the floor, and has a flat affect. The nurse's highest priority in assessing the client on admission would be to ask him, one, how he sleeps at night, two, if he's thinking of hurting himself, three, about recent stresses, or four, how he feels about himself. And I know you guys all got this answer right because we talked about this already. The correct answer is two, if he's thinking about hurting himself. Go back to the question. He's admitted to a psych unit. He's shaven, has body over odor, so he's not taking care of himself. He's not showering. He's not shaving. He's got spots on his shirts and pants. He's not even changing his clothes. He's got a flat affect, so he's not smiling. He's not showing any emotion. He's moving slowly. He's gazing at the floor. He's not making eye contact. You're suspecting this patient most likely has major depression. The first thing you're going to ask, are you having thoughts of harming yourself? And if that patient says yes, you go and ask them, do they have the plan? Find out if they have access to the plan. And you're going to make sure that patient's on one-to-one. -one. So uh, number two is absolutely the correct answer. That is the number one question you're going to ask the patient. I'm so sorry, guys. I've run out of time. I can't wait to make a video for you guys for next week. Guys, um, I want to thank you. You guys have been putting in the comments how much I've helped you, those who have graduated, those who have taken their boards, and they write in the comments to let me know that I helped them pass. Guys, that is... I can't even explain to you how that makes me feel. That really gives me the push to keep going. It makes me realize that, you know, 
I'm helping. I'm affecting students out there and I'm so grateful for that. And so guys, I tell you, thank you for those words of encouragement. If there's anything that you'd like to see more of, if you'd like to see me cover, please go ahead and make sure that you drop it in the comments. Please guys, do not forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget to press that notification bell so you'll be notified every time a new video is re released. Um, don't forget, I have uh, lessons for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and you can also check me out on my other social media platforms, including TikTok. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and you'll see me on the next video.